Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Hishida. I'm with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and I'm happy to be here today. I'm glad that many of you are interested in this topic and ready to learn and engage in the conversation. Today's topic is interdisciplinary care and maximizing community partnerships to serve youth experiencing homelessness. Our agenda for the session is broken into four parts. First, we will talk about uh, who we are uh, at the council, and then we'll spend a little bit of time on how programs define homelessness. Next, we'll describe for uh, care for youth experiencing homelessness, and then we'll end with how programs can provide care through community partnerships. So this is a lot to cover. We'll go ahead and jump right in. This is a poll, uh, learning about your primary role at your organization. <clears throat> and if you haven't already, I would encourage you to visit the website for the National Health Care for the Homeless Council at www nhchc.org. Uh, if you're not already a member, you can sign up for free as an individual member. Once you do that, you'll be added onto our listserv and then start receiving our monthly e-newsletters, which is chock full of the newest resources um, in the field from the council. <clears throat> Um, similar to School-Based Health Alliance, we are primarily funded to provide technical assistance and training. Uh, technical assistance is free. Um, if you have any questions, whether it's clinical, uh, related to policy and advocacy work, uh, research-related question, uh, or any other type of, um, could be administrative issues at your clinic, or just around the topic of uh, homeless health care, <clears throat> you can reach out to us. And we have a great uh, technical assistance manager, Michael Durham, who, if he doesn't know the answer, will know uh, who to contact. And so you can reach out to us with any questions or issues, and we're happy to direct those <clears throat> and respond to those questions. Uh, also, with our trainings, we have an annual Healthcare for the Homeless conference every year. Uh, but we also have regional in-person meetings, uh, virtual training, and then uh, regularly uh, scheduled <clears throat> or uh, yeah, webinars, uh, so at least two a month. Um, so again, if, you're, if you sign up for our individual membership, that uh, will sign you up for the e-newsletters, and you'll learn about uh, all of the trainings and available resources that we have going on each month. Uh, and upcoming, we have, uh, we're small staff, but we have a policy and advocacy team uh, located in Baltimore. Uh, so if you have any uh, questions or concerns uh, around policy and advocacy, we have a great team to respond to that. We also have a research team and as well as research committees. So if you're, um, interested in research or your organization, uh, either as an organization or an individual, um, we have opportunities for you all to participate in research or get your uh, questions around research answered. We also have special topics that we address at the council, including medical respite. So medical respite are for folks who are um, experiencing homelessness, go to the hospital uh, for treatment, emergency room, and then once they're discharged, they still need a place to recuperate, um, but they're discharged back into the streets. So our medical respite programs uh, help to support those individuals, give them a place to uh, rest and recover. Sometimes at the clinical, uh, uh, they have uh, medical providers at these medical respites program. Sometimes it's more just uh, a shelter, but that um, caters to their situation. 
Um, so we have a great medical respite coordinator uh, who's very knowledgeable. We also have a committee dedicated to this topic. So providers and administrators from all across the country uh, meet regularly once a month. Uh, they meet twice a year in person um, to talk about uh, these issues to help navigate uh, and guide the work of the council and help direct us and uh, tell us about challenges and issues that uh, they're facing in their communities and uh, in, in that way navigate and lead uh, the council in our projects, um, <clears throat> in our national projects. We also have a supportive housing, uh, uh, well, we have a relationship with the uh, Corporation for Supportive Housing and we have a supportive housing project lead, so Lauren Berner. She does a lot of work on this topic, papers, trainings, um, other publications, and uh, webinars and such. So it's a topic that we have a special interest in. And then one of our uh, few committees, the Clinicians Network, and so some people uh, kind of shy away from the word clinicians, um, thinking it's only for, you know, uh, medical doctors or nurse practitioners. But uh, for the council, clinicians are anyone who has direct contact with consumers or clients. Uh, so if you're doing, for example, outreach um, or you're a social worker, um, therapist, dentist, uh, ophthalmologist, any other type of medical provider, um, you know, or again, you're just doing more of the enabling services. So doing translation, interpretation, uh, providing transportation to consumer clients, any type of uh, direct contact with clients would be considered a clinician. Um, so we encourage you all to join the Clinicians Network. This is free, again, a way to um, not only engage in our work at, at the council, but to get that peer support, to connect, to build a community for yourself uh, in this sometimes difficult work that we do. Um, you know, sometimes it feels sort of isolating working with the population and maybe nobody else in your community uh, is doing is, or locally is, is doing the uh, specific work that you're doing. Um, having a, a community on national level really gives support, I think, for folks who who are really um, who are really needing that. And again, great way to just engage with just a passionate uh, group of individuals. So please uh, encourage you all to visit the website, see what we have going on, reach out to us. And um, yeah, we look forward to working with you all. <clears throat> oh, and one of the, the best things, I, uh, well, one of the things uh, at the council, I think, is the mission. And one thing it, that, that we believe is that one, one is too many. One, one individual, one child is too many. Um, experiencing homelessness, experiencing hunger. Um, and here are just some numbers just to ease us into the context of what we're talking about today. So in 2017, well, this is the latest report from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, the last report came out December 2017. Uh, they reported 40,800 people were experiencing homelessness as unaccompanied youth. The way they define unaccompanied youth is an uh, individual under the age of 25 uh, experiencing homelessness on their own. Uh, also, the same number, so um, in January 2017, about 185,000 people in families with children were experiencing homelessness. And this is um, any night, you know, one night a year. So for on one night, this is the, the count that they had. 
And then just fewer than 22,000 people were in families with children in which the head of the household was in unaccompanied youth, so uh, someone aged tw uh, under 25. <clears throat> And the U.S. Department of Education reports that public schools served a total of 1.36 million youth experiencing homelessness in the uh, latest school year that they reported, which is uh, 2015 and 2016 school year. Uh, if you are interested in research and data, the, the citation at the bottom right of your screen is a great resource. Um, for you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I tend to start with, uh, for my presentations, uh, defining homelessness, especially when speaking to groups that maybe don't have uh, as much experience or exposure to the healthcare for the homeless field, uh, because part of providing culturally sensitive care is breaking down stigma. And in defining homelessness, this can help reassess the image that many of us may have in mind when we think about, you know, quote unquote, uh, homeless child, the homeless child. When we have this thought, sometimes we think the, the we go to the most extreme uh, version of street life, which may certainly be the case, but as well, an individual can have a bed at night to sleep on, even have a physical roof over their head, and that could still be considered a form of homelessness. And we'll look over some definitions in a moment. Uh, if that's not already understood, then uh, it'll become a little bit more clear. Um, also, uh, I'll say uh, sometimes, you know, we can su suspect issues at home. You know, if you have a child coming into your school or clinic, um, and we, we can suspect issues at home when it comes to hygiene or um, maybe some just general disheveled appearance. And we use that as, um, or you all may use that as a, as a best indicator, um, but in many cases that may not be true, um, especially if you're thinking about, you know, a parent who is, who is terrified to, to get their child taken away. If they and they think if they if you if the system if another adult finds out or someone in the school system finds out that they're sleeping in their car um, at night or they're jumping from motel to friend's couch to um, you know parent's couch and they're kind of moving their family around moving their children around um, they're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that their children. Um, don't bring any suspicion of their living situation to school. So they take really good care of making sure that there's no, um, you know, the children are dressed in clean clothes, um, they're showering every day, um, and so, and they may even be, um, you know, telling the child, you know, make sure that, you know, this is not something that we're, that we talk about. And again, they, they don't want to, to cause any suspicion to um, take that risk of, of losing their children. <clears throat> so, um, and, and I don't think anyone uh, would argue that, you know, it has to be an extreme form of homelessness. There's living on the streets for a child to um, benefit from uh, the services that we're offering at our clinic. So in defining homelessness, uh, it depends. It depends on um, your funding, the funding agency. But one of the, uh, the common denominators for the definitions is instability of living arrangements. So instability is that 
critical component. We're curious about um, if your clinic uh, consistently assesses for housing instability. And how that question is asked, I think um, you know th there are best practices for that. If, if you have questions, please reach out to us. Um, but we'll move on to uh, some of the language from uh, legislation. And this one comes from uh, Section 330 of the Public Health Service Act, so the funding for health centers. Um, this one provides examples like shelter, mission, single room occupancy facilities, abandoned buildings or vehicle, but again, the language um, of un uh, instability, so unstable or non-permanent situation. Uh, this one from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, again, the Section 330. Um, this one also provides the um, examples, um, but again, uh, or or this one uh, points out, I'm sorry, at the end, uh, right here, it says resident in transitional housing. So transitional housing programs where, you know, individual may even have a key to their uh, a place. Um, so it's a consistent, you know, bed at night, roof over the head, but because it's transition, uh, transitional, um, knowing that, okay, they may only be in this living situation for however long the program runs, so maybe three months, six months, but it is non-permanent. They're not planning to, they can't stay there for as long as they'd like. Um, and so in that case, they would be uh, qualified for homeless services. Uh, the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act, where many of you on the school system are familiar with, with um, this one. Um, again, it provides some specific examples, talks about uh, shelters, uh, transitional shelters, public spaces, abandoned buildings, um, substandard housing, and uh, similar places. And then going back again to the Health Resources and Services Administration, um, this one comes from a program assistance letter. Um, but what is important about this one, again, if you go toward the end, uh, it provides an example of uh, a specific example that we may not often think about, or, or um, which is <clears throat> being released from a system like prison or hospital. Um, and they don't have a stable housing situation to which they can return. Um, also, they uh, focus on the doubled up uh, experience. So this is kind of what we see maybe with the older youth, which is uh, couch surfing, you know, jumping from friends to friends house or even family or relatives. Um, but again, it's instability, it's not permanent. Uh, for our healthcare providers on, on the line, uh, it's important to know about uh, how we define homelessness uh, and I, being able to identify our students who are um, having the, experiencing the different uh, uh, types of homelessness because um, not, it's, it's not only to address the need for shelter and housing. It's not only to provide those services or at least offer a referral for those services, but um, for, for us, we need to be able to uh, identify barriers to care that uh, unstable living um, creates. And so uh, some examples would be transportation, um, prioritizing basic needs, um, so if they, if they're trying to shuffle to get to um, the shelter in time before the curfew, or and so they, their um, transportation, their bus doesn't take them from the clinic uh, to the shelter in time, they're not going to prioritize coming to a healthcare appointment, follow-up appointment, and then miss 
um, their curfew at the shelter. Also, things like medical care treatment, if, uh, you know, common example we provide is the refrigeration of medication. So if you're, if you're spending night in your car and your medication, you don't have a place to store your medication, um, that would be a barrier to care that um, folks who have a stable place to live don't um, maybe have to think about. Uh, also, homelessness exacerbates health issues. Um, and then we're also thinking about a critical developmental period for youth. So we, what we know about brain development and trauma. So having uh, experiencing homelessness during this critical time is going to impact them in ways that uh, their housed counterparts may not have to think about uh, or may not have to deal with. And then uh, for administrators, on the call reporting to the Uniform Data Services or the Data System or UDS. <clears throat> uh, that's going to be important not only to um, help inform the need for more funding for homeless services, um, but also just having accurate data as far as a number of children or people experiencing homelessness. So again, uh, definitions are going to depend on funding streams um, and why that's important, not just to know how you, how you as a program uh, defines homelessness, but your partners, when you think about uh, connecting with other services in your community, um, how are they uh, defining homelessness, not only for their mission, um, if they're mission driven, but uh, also thinking about where they're funding, where they're able to um, uh, allocate their funding if uh, homelessness is defined uh, in a certain way or they're only providing a certain type of, uh, you may be shelter only type of uh, homeless experience, um, then you know, that's something that you two would have to navigate as a, as a partnership. Okay, so we're going to spend the rest of our time, the brief time that we have together, uh, thinking about interdisciplinary care and community partnerships. So when working with um, just regular uh, community or vulnerable populations, we need interdisciplinary teams uh, because this is what responds to the whole person and the whole person's uh, healthcare needs. And when, again, we're thinking about barriers to care, this is um, one way to address uh, a, that barrier of transportation issues, about t availability of resources with timing, uh, with time resources, as well as financial resources. Having uh, interdisciplinary care team in one location is going to be ideal for uh, our populations. And many of us are well aware of that. Uh, and we'll get into specifics uh, around the types of uh, care that we're providing. But uh, why this is being emphasized, particularly for this population, for youth, is because we're responding to issues related to trust. I'll speak on this briefly. But uh, promising practices for working with youth require these six equally important elements. Um, and at the top we see trauma-informed practices. So children who have experienced environments that are not safe, that are constantly changing, or are chaotic in, in some way, um, so that would be, that would make it you know, emotionally or psychologically not safe. But um, when children experience these environments, they may not easily trust others, right? And that makes sense. If we think about how trauma impacts an individual, um, so can, uh, trauma impacts an individual cognitively, physiologically, psychologically, emotionally, relationally, or interpersonally, so when we think about interdisciplinary teams, they uh, function as another factor on this wheel, which is the multiple points of entry. 
So in addressing potential trust issues, the child may build a relationship uh, and start to trust one person on your staff. It could be the front desk staff person. It could be a security officer. If you have um, something like that at your program, uh, it could be the outreach worker, which we tend to see with the older youth or just youth in within youth programs. That relationship kind of starts with that outreach worker. Could be the the therapist if you have a mental health ther behavioral therapist. It could be the medical doctor, the physician. But they have that you know one that starts with that one relationship at your program, and that may be the entry for them to access other services or care at your program. Because once an uh, individual child is engaged, they're more likely to access additional services from other team members. So you think about, um, you know, the youth who isn't going to trust maybe adults in their system, especially if adults were a you know, perpetrator of um, some other type of trauma that they've experienced, but they may not trust adults, they may not trust these systems, but they're in your environment. You know, they're coming around, you know, especially with a school, it's, it's a lot easier, but if you're thinking about a youth drop-in center, for example, they're coming around, um, they're kind of scoping it out, their peers may be in, in that environment, but they, they see something consistent. They see the outreach worker kind of hanging out in the in the lobby or in the courtyard, um, not really um, trying to to uh, get used to to really do anything other than feel comfortable. Um, but they start having a conversation, sharing about their day uh, with this outreach worker. They may connect for some for some reason. Um, Maybe uh, they kind of are part of the same group or uh, look, have an appearance, of sim a similar appearance, what have you. But they start kind of opening up a little bit about their day, very casual. But the thing is, it's consistency. So um, maybe for a few days, for several weeks, they see that same uh, outreach worker individual out in the courtyard and, you know, it's just casual, how's your day going? And the youth start to share about maybe an issue that they had um, with, the, with a teacher at school. And, um, you know, outreach worker just listens. Man, that really, that really sucks that you're having, you know, issues. Um, and, you know, I wish that wasn't going on for you. You know, I heard other students having issues with that same teacher or what have you. Um, you know, after that relationship ha is starting to build and that child is starting to build trust, I mean, uh, you're already kind of starting to build trust if you're sharing about, you know, some, some problem that you may be having. So there's some, some trust there. At some point, you know, the student is still having issues weeks or later. And the outreach worker says, you know, do uh, you know, you know, Melissa down the hall? Uh, she has, I heard that she worked with other other students with that same issue and, or with similar issues with other teachers or even with that art teacher. And I heard that she was pretty helpful. Um, it's free. Uh, people just go in and talk with her you know, just the 30 minutes, an hour every week, they, they think it's really helpful. That's, that's what I heard. If you want to, I'm happy to, to make that connection. Or you can just, you know, kind of pop your head in, in her door. It's the last one down the hall. All right. And so the child is more open to, to uh, accessing that, that service with, with the therapist, with Melissa. <clears throat> So this can be, again, uh, that trust, that relationship is going to be a point of entry for that child to engage in other services. Um, and it, again, it could be any, any staff member. <clears throat> but the question is, how does this outreach worker know that Melissa 
the therapist it, is familiar with that topic, is familiar with that issue, has helped other students with that issue. How did that outreach worker know to tell that student that? Um, and it, we're not lying to the, the client, lying that's just disingenuous and breaks trust. So how does the outreach worker know this? Um, it's these interdisciplinary care team meetings. These interdisciplinary care team meetings are places to support our staff. Um, it's not just to share about new rules that we have at the program. It's to share about success stories that we have with clients that are coming to our program without breaking you know, confidentiality or anything like that. It's to share about cases, to share about clients, success stories, challenges, um, to give updates, et cetera. Um, but this way that the different team members um, or different staff are familiar with services that are being provided at your program. And again, it's a way to support your staff ultimately to support uh, youth in your community that are in need. So this concept wheel is something just to orient and ground us as we move forward and think about interdisciplinary teams and community partnerships. And that center piece, the child center, um, another term that we use for this is uh, consumer involvement. Um, so consumer involvement is really thinking about involving that individual in their care, involving them so that individual treatment but also involving them on a more systems level, administrative level, in your programming, getting their input on, um, on uh, different aspects of your program as far as design and development of services. So we'll talk about care. Again, child-centered, culturally sensitive. We want to give the child and family as many choices and opportunities to be involved in their own care. So we want to give options, not advice. And that's just a reminder because as adults, it's easy to know better, or not just adults, but just medical providers, et cetera, to know better. Um, and we personally take that responsibility for the well-being of our clients, especially children. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. But um, knowing those boundaries and balance between autonomy and safety, that is definitely a skill set. Those lines can be a little bit blurry. blurry. Uh, we tend to err on the side of caution, which some may argue is a detriment to building uh, those relationships with the young people, um, with young people, especially, you know, young people that need to engage in these systems where they may not feel safe or they may not feel like um, they're understood or they, they belong. So right now we're going to get into the specifics of of care, so it's medical services, sexual health, and mental and behavioral health. And the next slide, we uh, there's two more that we'll cover. But first, uh, medical services. When working with this population, we find that on top of common ailments uh, that we see in general population, like the cold, uh, like a cold or flu, uh, some of their acute and chronic conditions are related to the living conditions. So for instance, if uh, people are rough sleeping, uh, term we use uh, for you know sleeping on the streets, sleeping under bridges, um, these individuals are more likely uh, going to be exposed to harsh weather elements. So in the summer times, we're kind of looking out for symptoms related to heat stroke. In the winter seasons, hypothermia. Um, and those types of uh, health issues. But also, uh, we're considering living environments if families are staying in motels or other shared living spaces, so uh, skin issues, lice, scabies, bug bites, rashes, other skin infections, we see more, um, more of those pop up for this population. We also find uh, many times there is limited access to oral health and eye care services, so we make sure that we have those um, referrals in place, those relationships with other service providers to be able to um, 
not only refer but provide you know uh, that warm handoff at trans at least transportation services um, uh, <clears throat> for for this population. Uh, but we also consider children with chronic conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and obesity. Um, so we're thinking about barriers to care. We think about how um, those conditions are being treated and how the interventions uh, for these conditions are influenced by their unstable housing um, situation. So uh, mentioned including the uh, prescriptions that require refrigeration. Sometimes clients are worried that uh, their that their prescriptions may get stolen or misplaced if they don't have a place like a locker or something to, at night or they're sharing with other maybe strangers um, that they're worried that if a, you know others see pill bottles it may get stolen. So some things that we um, can consider and have a conversation about with our clients. Uh, let's see, medical, okay, so a missing follow-up appointment. This is a frequent occur occurrence across the board in community health. And that's gonna be due to many factors, but also we think about people experiencing homelessness, again, the competing priorities, so keeping a healthcare appointment may not be at the top of their list, especially if they've already gotten their prescription, they've already gotten medication, their follow-up appointments may not be a top priority. So having that conversation with that client, um, just opening that up with them, doing motivational interviewing techniques, that has shown to increase consumer involvement in their care, but also making sure that they're getting um, everything that they, that they need and um, you're addressing any barriers that they have to um, making any follow-up appointments. So thinking developmentally uh, with sexual health services, children are at this critical transition period, right? When it comes to identity, sexuality, relationships. So we have to think about what services we're offering in regards to sexual health. Even if you're thinking, well, I don't you know, serve the older youth, we need to consider that some of the younger children are being exposed to risk factors early on. So programs can uh, identify consumers who may be at risk for sexually transmitted diseases and sex-related violence and engage those youth as early as possible to reduce risk um, one, one area of concern is survival sex, which is the exchange of sex for a place to stay or for money, for food, et cetera. Um, in thinking about assessing for risk factors, we think about uh, certain uh, populations. So uh, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, homeless uh, youth have significantly greater likelihood of reporting survival sex than their heterosexual and non-transgender counterparts. Research has also shown that both males and females participate in survival sex and African-American homeless youth were significantly more likely to engage in survival sex than white homeless youth. <clears throat> Drug use plays a role in increasing sexual risk behaviors, especially among newly homeless youth. Uh, but, you know, right now it's, uh, it's unclear about the exact relationship between substance use and survival sex. But training providers to assess for risk and make not only services like treatment available, but uh, education, that's going to be important for our programs. And a member thinking about trust and relationships, if that hasn't been built, you know, youth are not going to feel comfortable many times to disclose their sexual activities, any symptoms that they're having. They may not even try to access treatment or services. So 
something to keep in mind with this population, uh, pregnancy. So rates of pregnancy correlate with housing status. Data suggests that 50% of unaccompanied youth have had a pregnancy experience. And one study showed that both accompanied and unaccompanied young males experiencing homelessness were less likely to use contraception, it was about 30%, than their housed counterparts, which is about 60%. So programs can offer services that may help limit the number of unplanned pregnancies, and that can include distribution of uh, contraceptives or uh, education, if for whatever reason your program's not able to do uh, direct uh, direct services at least have referrals for those services, for contraceptions education for this uh, population. Uh, lastly, quickly as we move on, uh, for youth who are pregnant, remember we saw that number at the end with youth who um, are parents of young children. So for youth who are pregnant or already parents, there are uh, special services that uh, could be offered to, uh, to that or special programming that you all could offer at your clinics. But the National Network for Youth, NN4Y, right there on the slide, suggests that, um, well, suggest has a list of uh, practices and programs for pregnant and parenting youth. So uh, I would recommend visiting their website and accessing that list and resources. And I'm happy to, to share that with you too if you're um, if you're interested, can't, uh, can't easily find it. Uh, finally, back up real quick. Uh, finally, this goes back to the first point with the screening for violence. So youth experiencing homelessness are at increased risk for intimate partner violence. And that's due to several potential factors, including turning to survival sex, uh, using substances, and uh, participating in illegal activities. So that's going to increase their vulnerability to exploitive relationships and interpersonal abuse. So assessing and addressing abuse uh, and imminent danger is, is part of creating the safe space for youth, but programs also need to have materials and other, other means available to educate youth about abusive relationships. Um, because they, if they grew up in uh, exposed to violence or exposed to adult relationships that were abusive, then they would think that that type of behavior is normal and that's just that's just life. Um, but if we can educate youth about healthy relationships as a, um, also prevention and an awareness measure, um, that's going to uh, help them as they form and develop uh, their romantic relationships and um, or uh, other types of relationships. Uh, also, we're, as part of the education, informing them about protective services um, in case they are currently in abusive relationships or, you know, again, if they find themselves in one in the future, they'll know, you know, how to respond, where they can turn to for help. Okay, mental and behavioral health. Standard mental behavioral health services for youth experiencing homelessness include regular screenings and treatment for depression, anxiety, other mood disorders, um, also suicidality, so risk and uh, risk a uh, risk assessment for suicidality. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, we'll talk about trauma in a moment, um, also substance use. With substance use, again, thinking developmentally, for some time, uh, for some time, for some, this is a time for exploration, uh, but also peer influence. And again, young people who use substances do hear these messages from uh, adult outsiders who are saying drugs are bad for your health. You know, they hear that message, they get it. But 
if these kids are suffering from a mood disorder and, and not getting treatment uh, and their symptoms are getting worse because of the stress of unstable living conditions, they may be using it as a coping strategy, uh, using substances as a coping strategy. And we find that very common as, uh, as a trauma response. So it can be difficult for adults who are providing care to not have this judgmental tone about substances. Um, and that's where the motivational interviewing skills come in. That's where having these harm reduction programs that are part of our clinics uh, become very uh, useful for us and beneficial for the client. And lastly, for the mental health crises, when clinics are closed and staff are not on call or available, uh, informing our new clients and reminding existing clients, not just kind of posting those numbers on our walls or doors, but uh, having those conversations with clients about um, the 24-7 hotlines, crisis lines, if those are in your communities, but also there's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So uh, having that is uh, available and those conversations is going to be important for this population. Okay, lastly, trauma. I'll just touch briefly uh, on the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study that um, if you've been in this field for even a brief amount of time, you're, you've come across this study. But it explains how traumatic childhood experiences such as experiencing homelessness, um, but other traumatic events place individuals at risk for negative health outcomes in adulthood. And this study has had uh, significant, and, and certainly still, has significant implications for service provision. So a program can address trauma both systematically and individually. On a systems level, um, it, or, uh, yeah, on a systems level, that includes the trauma-informed practices on a programmatic level. So that's outlined in the original study. And that includes increasing awareness of the occurrence of trauma. And we increase awareness by educating staff and clients. That clients is an important part too, right? What's trauma 101 for clients? Um, but that also includes routine screenings for trauma, routine screenings for exposure to violence. The other um, practice is an understanding by staff and clients of the behavioral coping strategies that, individually, that individuals commonly utilize to mitigate the emotional impact of the traumatic experiences. And that's what, we, that's what I mentioned about the substance use as a coping uh, response mechanism. When addressed individually, uh, trauma is uh, more uh, addressed on a mental health, behavioral health uh, treatment um, method. So that's going to be a narrative therapy, some type of uh, therapeutic model, but narrative therapy, uh, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing therapy, EMDR, uh, expressive arts, has been proven to be effective to mitigate symptoms and provide long-term treatment for trauma. But the mental health provider is going to be able to do that type of assessment for uh, the type of trauma and treatments that's going to be appropriate. But if you don't have that as part of your interdisciplinary care team or part of your clinic, uh, having those referrals in place so that community partnership is going to be essential really important for, for this particular population. Again, thinking developmentally, how this the trauma is having a lasting impact on that individual all the way up until, um, you know, if, if an individual is fortunate enough to um, make it to a, a later age, it's going to have lifelong impact. So addressing trauma as early as possible is going to be uh, something that we need to think about as we're developing our programming. Uh, additional reasons for integrating trauma-informed approaches with this population is for our staff. So we're reducing staff burnout 
increasing um, engagement and increasing just overall organizational effectiveness. The last two types of care I'll highlight are uh, social and support services and healing arts and other creative interests. Um, the social and support services include that housing component, so programs should consider offering housing assistance either directly or through referral and or um, collaborating with local housing authorities. There's also uh, programs, the Runaway and Homeless Youth Grant programs. Uh, I'll talk about resources uh, from that agency in a moment. Supportive housing programs. So supportive housing are that are um, a type of uh, transitional housing or uh, subsidized housing, but it has that inclusion of the case management services. And then also your local continuum of care uh, programs. In addition to housing services and case management, common uh, support so social services for this population include family reunification services, employment, uh, GED, other educational services such as career counseling. And so for you all who are working with schools um, or within schools, you're in an ideal position to have a focus and uh, on education and offer these uh, educational or em employment services. Uh, also, programs should be considering offering legal services for assistance with um, benefits, so disability benefits, uh, especially for any emancipated youth, um, those youth signing leases for the first time or getting housing, um, being able to support them in that, providing some professional advice or guidance uh, is going to be a benefit for your, for your young person. Uh, also, youth coming out of incarceration or the juvenile justice system, having those legal services, um, someone to be on their side and support them uh, is going to do um, a lot of good for that and support that, that young person. Uh, also, as lastly here, addressing transportation issues. Uh, we, we talked about barriers to care, but the cost of transportation is something a lot of our uh, clinics and programs sometimes don't really think about. Um, they just provide the referrals and kind of, you know, just hope that they can get there. But, you know, it's something, a conversation we can have, something we can at least just offer um, without having to uh, get them to explain or provide proof of need. So offering bus tokens, um, you know, and especially thinking about uh, referral agencies um, that don't offer, uh, that offer clinic when after school hours. Uh, so thinking about hours, location, um, financial costs, and um, having those conversations with the client. Okay, healing arts and other creative interests. So many of our health centers, uh, healthcare for the homeless, that serve a large portion of youth. Um, so as a health center, you know, we, we don't turn anyone away. So we provide care to zero to you know, 100, um, but there are just some programs that uh, that um, um, are kind of the programming's more tailored to you. So uh, although they don't turn anyone away, they predominantly have uh, uh, youth clientele. So these uh, programs, um, the ones that we interviewed for our project on engaging um, homeless youth and best practices, these programs offered some type of unique classes or services that we did not, that we tend not to see with um, other healthcare for the homeless programs that primarily serve adult populations. Um, and then again, being situated in a school, you all uh, may have more access to resources to support these types of services. Um, so that's going to be a great a partnership for you all to uh, to continue to develop and um, and access resources from. Um, and with the consumer involvement piece, that child-centered piece, we we want the uh, input of youth as we begin designing and developing these these particular services. 
as well as other as well as other services. But um, um, but with these, it's really more tailored to their um, need and special interest. And we also see that you know it takes time for these special services to grow and become established. Um, sometimes uh, programs and administrators, clinicians feel a little discouraged once they start these really interesting um, services that they started because, you know, they interviewed or did a focus group of, you know, 20 youth that are regularly coming to their program and they said, okay, they're all interested in starting this yoga class, but, you know, people aren't showing up. Uh, so there's, uh, but sometimes what we find it takes time for these services to grow and become established. Um, the uh, people have to kind of attend, enjoy it word of mouth. But uh, what the, what's important is that you will continually to uh, assess for the quality of these programs and continue to get input from young folks who are attending these services and then make those changes accordingly. So get input, but then also do something about it. Um, again, your youth, you know, we really need to hear and speak uh, to the youth and hear exactly what it is that they need because it's a whole different um, ball game. It's a whole different time than what we experienced when we were younger. So what they're looking for, what they need, what they like, um, some things uh, will always, you know, be the same, but um, many times it, it's going to be uh, very different, very different for uh, young people. So one uh, a very popular service is going to be around technology, the internet, social media, um, having some type of special programming for them to be engaged in this manner has been uh, popular. Some type of visual performing arts uh, tends to be popular. Uh, interestingly, civic activities or some type of community involvement. Uh, well, this tends to be more for the older youth, but uh, the administrators kind of are surprised when they find out, oh, okay, like young folks actually want to be involved in in um, these types of activities. Uh, so, so setting that up and supporting youth to be involved in the community, um, doing some type of civic leadership. Uh, has has been uh, successful in the past for some programs. Writing and poetry, music is a popular. Entrepreneurship uh, is a thing that I, I guess this is more for the older youth as well. Um, so maybe like 15, 16 uh, and older. Um, but there's this really special program. Uh, it was in Oregon where they supported you to start a business, a mobile juicing business. And so they had folks from, in, from the community teach about um, starting a business, so the different steps, and then actually running the business and doing it. And these youths, they kind of uh, took turns to, uh, to, to transport the juice, to ride the the bicycle uh, little setup they had for the juicing company. Um, so they took turns doing that, but then they were all involved in um, the business side aspect of that uh, service and that program. And so they learn these skills that they will be able to take um, in the future, but then they also gain profits too. So they're doing all the work and then they, they were able to reap the benefits, the financial benefits of um, and then, of course, some of it went back to the, the programming. But um, so, yeah, it was, that was a great, unique little um, program that they had there at that Healthcare for the Homeless. Uh, so of course, sports, sports and exercise is popular, just as uh, music is. Uh, in yoga, yoga was a new thing uh, for one of our programs is to start gardening, body work, so massage. Um, offering those kinds of services, popular, crafting. Um, so, yeah, these are just some options. If you're interested in, in starting these programs, I'm happy to connect you with other, uh, other clinics that were and other programs that we're starting. 
uh, some unique services. But again, getting input from you, hearing from them what their interests are, what they want to start doing, developing, spending their time, um, and then building these community partnerships to be able to offer these services or refer your youth clients is going to be um, the best way to support them. So given the multiple issues that are presented by our youth who are experiencing homelessness, it is unrealistic to expect any one provider agency to be able to meet uh, all the needs in in any situation, you know. But we know those those amazing programs that do it all, that it's the one-stop shop, that the youth client can come in and they can get all their health care, all their um, social services, and then also their their peer relationships, their um, fun, um, their learning, uh, employ employment skill development. They get all of that in one place. We know those programs, but you know those programs didn't happen overnight. They didn't happen over a few years. Many of them took decades to be that successful. And to um, but it but. It, and they have these great community partnerships to be able to support their programming as well. Um, but it, it starts small. It starts with these community partnerships. We need each other. We need to be able to share our resources, not just financial resources, our staff, our time, to be able to support the young, the young children, the, young, um, the youth in our communities and their families. So we had a poll uh, asking about who your current partners are. Uh, community partners are, can act, again, as that multiple point of entry, too, for our young person. So a young person may have a really great relationship with one of your community partnerships, uh, partners, and they may not know that you provide free health care services or that you're providing, you know, that you've helped other youth with some type of, you know, maybe STI, STD, or um, with a similar skin rash issues, uh, health issues, whatever services that you're offering. They may not know that that service is available to them at no cost or that, you're support, that you can support them with transportation. But your community partner is going to be a great referral source for you, can be an, multi, an entry point for that youth to get health, the health care that they need as, as prevention or as treatment to make sure that those health issues aren't exacerbated. Uh, it can also, your community partner can also be a place to market your services um, and for, uh, for you to market uh, services for your partner. As a school-based health clinic, you're one step ahead of the curve because embedding medical services in agencies that youth already view as a trusted space is often an effective way to engage uh, this particular population, youth experiencing homelessness. Uh, local educational agencies carry mandates from the McKinney-Vinto Homeless Assistance Act and uh, required to designate that homeless liaison who is responsible for working with homeless education issues in, in the area. So each state is required to have a coordinator for homeless education. And agencies, so you all can contact, if you already don't have a relationship um, with them, but you can contact the state coordinator to identify who the local school district uh, assigned liaison is. And if your district does not have a liaison, then your agency can advocate for one and inform the school district about uh, available funding for that position. So. What's a great uh, resource is the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth. Um, they're not only uh, the experts on the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act providing training and technical assistance, um, but they're also uh, just a great resource for facilitating 
local interagency collaborations. Uh, and another resource uh, for this particular population is Youth Build. It's an international program targeted to unemployed young people who have left school without a diploma and attempts to help them with uh, educational employment skills and leadership skills. So you may be thinking, well, I'm not going to be working with, you know, I'm already in the school, so I'm not working with people who've left school, but um, this, this population, there's a correlation between education and homelessness. And um, if a child chooses to leave school, we want them to know um, or have in the back of their mind or remember, oh, I remember seeing something like this or hearing uh, someone talk about, you know, some uh, an adult in, at school talk about this program um, that I could that I could utilize uh, in case or if I had, had ever decided to, to leave school because that that is an option for young folks. And so we want to make sure that if they do choose that, then that they will have uh, something that they can um, possibly uh, use and, and support them in, their, in that case. Uh, other community programs of interest in working with this population include drop-in centers. So these are more like the day centers and places where you can rest, shower, eat, receive other social services. So sending your clinicians or if you're a clinician going to these programs and providing health services at these sites are going to be ideal. Again, to um, to, to not only uh, support that youth who is having trouble kind of going to uh, you know, transporting themselves to different locations for, for care and treatment, um, but also building those relationships, having those relationships already in place, um, and then being a referral source for the drop-in center um, is, is going to be helpful for other youth in that community. Okay, the next bullet point, because of the disproportionate number of youth who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, queer, questioning, uh, it is critical to be aware of, if not have an active partnership with local programs that specialize in LGBTQ populations, that have special programming, that, um, that provide other services to youth. They, if you have a special program in your community, they're probably are already addressing a homelessness on some level, but in whatever case, having a relationship with them, finding out what services they offer, finding out their type of programming, being available to them to serve their clientele or, uh, or going on their site to be able to offer healthcare services is going to be an um, ideal way to, to serve this population. Okay, I mentioned this program uh, previously, but the Runaway Homeless Youth Grants, grantees and programs, these are funded through the Family and Youth Services Bureau. So um, RHY is the acronym. Uh, these programs offer street outreach, emergency shelters, and longer-term uh, transitional living. Um, they also offer maternity group home programs, again, thinking about those young youth who are pregnant or, um, or parenting young children. So they offer these uh, special services. You can find a directory of uh, the RHY programs across the country through the Family and Youth Services Bureau uh, interactive mapping tool on their website. That's a great resource for programs as you start thinking about your community, developing these community partnerships. Uh, law enforcement. So some agencies may want to consider with their, uh, working with their law enforcement agencies just to, uh, a couple of things, to learn about the laws and policies that affect youth who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so again, those are going to um, depend on uh, your community. So finding out you know, what, what's unique to your um, local area is going to uh, be helpful as you provide treatment and care to this population. 
And then also uh, you can work with other community partners. So if you have a partnership with your drop-in center or your LGBTQ youth program, you all can partner to provide a training for officers or other law enforcement um, on how to work with, engage, and serve um, any youth that they come across um, that they um, they may not know and they may not even think that that youth may be experiencing homelessness, um, but we can kind of put that in their mind and then help them uh, have resources and how to respond once they find out or, um, or they may not find out, but how to respond to youth that they may come across so that they can support them in case that they are sleeping from couch to couch or they don't feel safe to go back home. Um, so it's a, it, that's a good partnership, again, all it, for the reason to support uh, our, young, our young folks. Uh, lots of transit authorities. Um, these have worked with our programs in the past. Um, those are great relationships because they help to subsidize um, bus and other transportation tickets for our clients. One great thing about uh, partnerships is the sharing of resources. Um, so here are examples of programs that many of our Healthcare for the Ho Homeless programs partner with. Um, university and college students uh, may provide services uh, such as mental health. So uh, do you know which your universities have uh, clinical mental health programs that um, all these students need to go to a practicum site? A lot of them don't know that they could, you know, uh, work at your clinic, that they could provide treatment and care to your clients, um, legal services as well. Uh, I mentioned the creative and healing arts. So many of our uh, predominantly youth-serving healthcare for the homeless programs utilize volunteer services, um, but these are great for those types of uh, special services because you know these providers really want to give back. So you think about the massage. Um, there was that program that provided um, four hours a week. Uh, a massage, and so it was a, a masseuse and their partner, and they would alternate weeks, and they just volunteered their time. Um, so a lot of people, uh, the professionals in, that offer unique services, want to want to do this for uh, for our program. So there was also a registered art therapist who came to a program for it was like three hours a week to do a group. Uh, art therapy is very popular. Um, again, if, if you don't have the funds or don't have staff that can run these programs, there are volunteers in our communities, professionals in our communities that are, um, are independent um, business owners and they provide their services uh, you know, to us at no cost. Potential collaborators also include churches and other religious organizations. So a lot of people program kind of stay away from um, from uh, faith-based organizations for one reason or, or another. Um, I think one one of the main reasons they're worried that um, the purpose of the religious uh, organization is not the same purpose. Uh, doesn't isn't just to serve the client. It's more to get the client involved in the religious um, religion or uh, religious uh, religiously affiliated activities. Um, so they don't want that to happen. So they kind of just all together stay away from um, like churches or what other other faith based organization. Um, but that's not the case for all all of these types of program. Sometimes um, a church, for example, just wants to give their resources um, and help uh, people in need. Sometimes that's their only motive. Um, and that's great. That's, um, we uh, will take those resources. Sometimes they just want to provide a meal a, a month and with no strings attached. And that's great. And that's something that you can determine 
if that kind of um, organization, the faith-based organization, is the kind that just wants to uh, support uh, your mission and you want to support, you know, um, that partnership. So they can be great collaborators. We had a uh, whole, whole um, it was a, a Methodist church group that supported uh, this homeless program by opening its doors during the winter months. So whenever temperatures drop below a certain degree, then um, the homeless services would get their van, uh, pick up uh, anyone who was out in the streets, and the churches would be open. The churches will alternate by week. Um, so if it was that church's week, then if it dropped below a certain degree, they would have their doors open. They would also store all the bedding um, and open up their kitchen. So the home. homeless program would be the ones that would be bringing the staff, bringing the volunteers, bringing the uh, cooking materials um, and meals, but it was a great partnership, um, and the church had asked for nothing in return. It was like, yeah, it's going to be, you know, what, like 8 o'clock at night or at whatever time up until, you know, the rules are you just have to be out of here, you know, everyone has to be out of here by whatever time and everything has to be cleaned up and everything has to be stored back. But yes, we will hold all your things for you and here's the space. So it was a great partnership. Um, again, uh, just something something to consider for programs. Also, uh, shelter housing and programs, uh, very relevant to this population. So what kind of relationship does your program have uh, with with these types of shelters here, with the domestic violence shelters, the family shelters, you know, are you sending your medical team to do outreach um, at these shelters for these populations? Uh, food banks are important potential collaborator because of what we know around the link between poverty and nutrition. So if we're assessing for housing instability, are we also considering the child's state of hunger or lack of access to food? And when we do find out that a family may have issues, do we have referrals in place to send our clients? Um, we have a community health center right up the street from uh, the council uh, staff in Nashville. And they have a mini food pantry that they restock with the support from the large, uh, larger food bank. And the nutritionists on staff, they meet with those who may be in need, but other staff know you know, if they're having a conversation with a client, if the medical doctor is having a conversation with the client or the nurses or um, the mental health person is, and they find out, you know, just offhanded, you know, they're having a conversation and find out, okay, you didn't eat last night. Why was that? You haven't been eating dinner. You know, and they find out, okay, you just don't have access. Uh, you don't have access to, to food regularly. Did you know we have a pantry you can restock, you know, when you come in for your for your appointments or you can restock, you know, you come in a group every week, go ahead and just restock. You just have to meet with the staff person to get access. Um, and so, again, helping to eliminate some of those barriers to transportation, um, to their uh, basic needs, meeting, um, prioritizing those basic needs is going to be uh, really helpful for this uh, population. And then I've already mentioned uh, many of these uh, local and government programs, but, uh, or these are, sorry, national programs, but uh, Departments of Human Services, Family and Children's Services, Health Department, common partners for these programs, uh, but the Runaway Homeless Youth, the National Network for Youth, National Association for the Education of Homeless Children Youth, and then the Healthcare for the Homeless. The Healthcare for the Homeless Grantees, this is a screenshot from our website, from our directory. So you can find your local grantee from our website, and we're happy to make those connections too. Their contact information is on there, but if you're having issues connecting, we're happy to help assist with that. Um, these are the grantees. There's about, I think, 270 at this point. Um, so these are just the grantees, not the clinics. So one grantee could have, you know, say 17 clinics in that 
city or community. So if you're looking specifically for the most local site, you may not um, see it on the website. You can go kind of to the nearest city and connect and see if they have a clinic or site kind of in your community. But again, we're happy to, to make those connections if you're having any issues. Final thoughts, final thoughts and quick tips uh, as we wrap up today. So best place to start is with an assessment of your current partnership. So go down the list of the types of programs we had mentioned today and find out or have an intern, have one of your interns find out, you know, about the local programs that fall under these many categories that we mentioned today. And then make an assessment to see, okay, do you have a relationship? What, how, what type of relationship? What resources are you sharing? Um, how long has that been in place? How strong is it if you were to, to measure it? So do that, do that needs assessment of all the, your community partnerships. Start there. <clears throat> Can, and then consider the role of mission statement with these programs and see if there's any overlap because that's where your two programs can align and this can be sort of that sales pitch for your collaboration. And then your employees. So your employees are well networked within the community and you can see if they can help um, build these collaborations. Find out who your staff knows, um, places that they've worked for in the past, partnered with in the past, and use this as leverage to gain new partnerships. Uh, feelings of competition, um, we've gotten feedback before, um, and it tends to be around funding, but that's, that may be getting in the way of some healthy partnerships. And so if we can, again, start and end with the mission of our programs, um, this can kind of eliminate some of that initial hesitancy to engage with uh, community programs or programs that we perceive may be our competitors for the same funding. Uh, memorandums of understanding and agreement. So partnerships can be informal, um, but then you can formalize it with these agreements. Um, many times these are going to be required to receive that federal grant funding, but we don't have to limit it to those cases. And getting everything in writing can help not just keep programs accountable, but help both programs feel at ease to engage in a partnership because they know what to expect from their relationship. They know what uh, they have to give. They know what they're going to gain. It's all clearly written out, um, and it makes that partnership a lot easier to, um, to move forward with. Uh, as programs uh, do that the need assessment, we also want to consider the role of our administrators versus the direct service providers or your clinicians. What are their, what are each roles on, uh, in the partnership? So direct service providers, clinicians may probably have the most contact with the collaborating partner sites because if they're having regular visits, um, many times it's the healthcare for the homeless staff that, you know, go weekly or even daily contact with the community, with that partner. Whereas the administrators, they really have to be more intentional sometimes to have that standing appointment, regular standing appointment, briefly, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, um, but schedule that meeting, you know, once a month um, at least. Um, just to check in to see how the partnership's going, um, anything you all can do, similar clients, similar, uh, any challenges, success stories, uh, just having those, those con uh, uh, check-ins is going to help the partnerships. But again, knowing the different roles between the providers and administrators. Uh, we mentioned already being a referral source for your partners, so um, you two are mutually benefiting um, all for really, in the end, benefit for the client. It's easy to put collaborations between services and programs um, that are part of the same agency. 
but even then it can be a challenge. So we can learn a lot about, you know, relationship building across programs, even within, you know, our own, our own agencies, something to consider. Uh, we talked about, um, you know, multiple points of entry, marketing our services. So collaborating agencies are places to engage current and potential consumers. Um, collaborations help communities not reinvent the wheel, so that would be a good collaboration. But if two agencies provide the same services near the same location, it's better to have more options for the young person to choose where they get their needs met. Again, they can just feel more safe with certain staff feel better, identify more with certain staff at one location than another, a different site. But again, this is all um, whatever whatever it takes for that young person to get the treatment and care that they need. That's, that um, funding is important. We wouldn't be here without funding, but you know, it's really all for um, the health and benefit of the young person. So that, that's something that we can keep in mind as we um, sometimes we feel struggle with uh, some of the challenges we we face with uh, potential partnerships. I hope all of this is a good jumping off point. Um, folks feel a little bit more oriented. You know, I'm sure there's a, still a lot of questions programs have and challenges that we're facing. If you plan to join us at the conference in Indiana in just a few weeks, uh, I'll be leading uh, the workshop and we will revisit some of these ideas, but uh, it's going to be more of a school, uh, small group activity and uh, folks will be able to discuss with each other some of the challenges they're facing with partnerships um, with these various types of programs such as law enforcement or even interagency collaborations we've heard issues with you know school administrators etc um, so we hope that the audience will be able to share those challenges come up with potential solutions share success stories share resources with one another if you have any questions, uh, want to have a further conversation, uh, feel free to, to reach out to us. Again, the website's www.nhchc.org. My name is Julie Hashida, and I hope that we uh, talk soon. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.